Here we go. All right. Archbishop Timothy P. Broglio was born on 1951 in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. He attended Catholic schools in Cleveland, Ohio. He earned a Bachelor of Arts at, in Classics at Boston College, an STB in Theology, and a Doctorate in Canon Law from the Pontifical Gregorian University, Rome. Archbishop Broglio was ordained to the priesthood for the Diocese of Cleveland on 19 May 1977 in the Chapel of the Immaculate Conception of the North American College, Rome. From 1977 to 1979, he served as an associate pastor, St. Margaret Mary Pasch Parish in South Euclid, and lectured in theology at Notre Dame College. From 1979 to 1983, Archbishop Broglio attended the Pontifical Ecclesiastical Academy. The Archbishop served as Secretary of the Apostolic Nunciature in Abidjan, Ivory Coast from 1983 to 1987, and of the Apostolic Nunciature in Asuncion, Paraguay, 1987 to 1990. From 1990 to 2001, Archbishop Broglio served as Chief of Cabinet to Angelo Cardinal Sodano, Secretary of State to St. Pope John Paul II, and Desk Officer for Central America. In February 2001, the Archbishop was named Apostolic Nuncio to the Dominican Republic and Apostolic Delegate to Puerto Rico. The Archbishop was ordained an Archbishop by His Holiness St. John Paul II on 19 March 2001. On 19 November 2007, Archbishop Broglio was named the 4th Archbishop of the Military Services USA and installed 25 January 2008, the Feast of the Conversion of St. John of St. Paul. As a member of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, the Archbishop currently serves as Secretary of the Conference and is a member of the Administrative Committee. In the past, he has served as Chairman of the Committee on International Justice and Peace, Chairman of the Canonical Affairs and Church Governance Committee, and of the Task Force for the 2013 Special Assembly, and was a member of the Committees on Canon Law and Church Governance, for Religious Freedom, and International Justice and Peace, and the Subcommittees for the Defense of Marriage and Health Care. He is a trustee and the Chancellor of Catholic Distance University, a member of the Board of Directors of the National Catholic Bioethics Center, and is the Chairman of the Communications Committee for the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. He served as the member of the Board of Directors for CRS from 2009 to 2011, and again from 2018 to present. The Archbishop's honors include Commander of the no National Order of Côte d'Ivoire, Commander of the National Order of the Polar Star, Sweden, Grand Cross with Silver Badge of the Order of Sanchez, Duarte, and Mela, Dominican Republic, Grand Officer of the Order of Bernardo O'Huggins of Chile, Commander of the Order of Antonio José de Irisari of Guatemala, Grand Cross of the Order of the Libertador San Martin of Argentina, Officer of the Orden de Mayo, Argentina, Commander of the Italian Republic, Knight Commander of the Holy Sepulchre with Star, Honorary Conventual Chaplain of the Order of Malta, Grand Cross of the Order of St. Michael of the Wing, Grand Officer of the Orders Saints Maurice and Lazarus, and Knight Grand Cross of the Sacred Military Constantinian Order of St. George. Archbishop Broglio is fluent in English, Italian, Spanish, and French. And I am not. <laughs> Your Excellency, welcome to Generation Vatican II. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and it's good to it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, so, uh, real quick, I think we should get something out of the way. You are the Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Military Services. I am an active duty. Uh, Navy sailor. And uh, so we should start by saying nothing in this interview is reflective of the opinions of the national of the United States government, the United States Navy, United States military. These opinions are our own. So Archbishop Broglio, uh, I think we could start with uh, a quick question about your shield. What does your shield signify? Well, basically, it's um, obviously the uh, seal is divided into quadrants and the actual fact of division is the cross of St. Andrew, which is in my family coat of arms and also reflects uh, my confirmation saint, Andrew. Um, at the bottom of the shield is the our waters, signifying baptism when we enter into eternal life, but also, um, for me, a reminder that I was born on the shores of Lake Erie. I've always served uh, close to major bodies of water, and of course, when I was made a bishop, I was being sent to an island. Um, also on the seal are um, two, the, uh, an eight-pointed star representing the Blessed Virgin Mary under her title of the Immaculate Conception, patroness of the United States, and also patroness of the seminary where I was ordained a priest of the North American College. Uh, there are two roses 
Uh, one of those signifies the diocese, uh, signifies Cleveland, where I spent a good deal of my life. The other one symbolizes the city of Rome, where I spent also a good deal of my life. Um, the other features of the coat of arms are the patriarchal cross, because I'm an archbishop, and then the ceremonial hat that bishops never wear, but uh, signifies their rank by the number of tassels that hang on either side. And that is in green, because that's the Episcopal color in, in heraldry. Um, mm -hmm. It's quite a lot going on in there. <laughs> yes, uh, there do is. Do you have a particular devotion? Do you have a particular devotion to Our Lady? Uh, I'm certainly devoted to Our Lady as, as, our, as our patroness, and also I think as the model, as the Second Vatican Council put it, of the first Christian, one who hears the Word of God and keeps it. And as I mentioned uh, the other Sunday, she also gives us a very good uh, path for life, which is do whatever he tells you, referring, of course, to her son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. And the two roses, you said Cleveland and Rome. Uh, how does one go uh, to Rome to do the extensive studies that you've done? Well, in order to go as a seminarian to the North American College, uh, you have to be sent by your bishop. So when I was uh, preparing to go to the seminary, um, at the suggestion of two priests, one who was a professor at St. Mary's Seminary in Cleveland, and another who was a dear friend of mine, they suggested to Bishop Isman that he send me to the North American College. And so I was the first seminarian sent there by the Diocese of Cleveland in, in over 10 years. Um, and then when the rector of the North American College became the Bishop of Cleveland, James Hickey, uh, many more followed. But um, in a certain sense, I broke the ice for the Diocese of Cleveland uh, in sending seminarians to back to the North American College. Uh huh. Well, that's pretty impressive. Um, how does this tie in with your motto, Seek ye the kingdom of God? Well, I think that's essential for, really, for any Christian, that uh, our goal in life is to dwell forever with the Lord in heaven. And uh, I, I see that as the as a guiding principle of my own life. I also see it as um, something that I should preach to others. So um, when I was asked um, if I would accept the nomination to the Dominican Republic in Puerto Rico, um, one thing, I was <laughs> a little bit in a state of shock, but one thing that I had certainly in my mind was, was this scripture passage um, to seek the kingdom of God. Has that been a guiding scripture passage in your life? It certainly has. And uh, recently, um, it's come very much to the fore in the, in the concern that the church has for evangelization. And I think ultimately, we evangelize because we want to invite people into the kingdom of God. And so, in a very real sense, for me... Um, it is, uh, it, it, it's become even more focused in, in my preaching and uh, in my activities as a, as a shepherd of this global archdiocese. Mm -hmm. uh, so how does that then relate to, I mean, you're the, archdi you're the archbishop of the military services. Um, could you talk about the unique structure of this archdiocese? Uh, I, don't, I don't understand if there's a, is this a province with, different subdioceses in it? Basically, the title Archbishop and the title Archdiocese is, is honorific. Um, we are okay. directly subject to the Holy Father, so um, that uh, it would be one element of, uh, there are many archdioceses in the world that uh, don't have provinces, but that are uh, directly subject to the Holy Father. That would be one element. The, the second element is it is a personal archdiocese. So, for instance, you uh, are in Norfolk, but um, you are a member of this archdiocese by virtue of who you are as a member of the of the United States Navy, um, and that is the case with uh, all of the members of the archdiocese. So, it serves active duty military and their families. It serves patients in the 153 veterans hospitals. It serves any Catholic who works for the U.S. federal government 
outside of the confines of the United States. So that would be uh, diplomatic personnel, it would be federal contractors, uh, Department of Defense teachers. Um, so anyone who um, falls into those categories, and then of course also the students at the four uh, military academies and the Merchant Marine Academy are also the responsibility of this archdiocese. So unlike a territorial mm -hmm. diocese, which depends on where you are, the military archdiocese depends on who you are. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a lot to unravel there. Let's start <laughs> with your travels. Like you said, you, you are responsible for basically people all around the entire world, outside the US, inside the US, I think. Uh, so we met in December and you like immediately flew out to spend Christmas in, oh gosh, where was it? Bahrain? Bahrain, and then uh, before that I went to Qatar. So- uh, Yeah, so talk about your travels. Where you go, the people you meet, the, the struggles and joys that you encounter. Well, essentially, it is a, it is an archdiocese that keeps its its shepherd on the move. So, um, in traveling, I've uh, basically tried to visit as many installations as I can, and I have four auxiliary bishops who help me in this ministry um, in order to make present the church and also the shepherd to uh, the faithful who have been assigned to us. Now. Um, Going to the Middle East at, at Christmas time uh, really follows the tradition that uh, Francis Cardinal Spellman began when he was the military ordinary or the military vicar, more properly spoken, um, during the uh, Second World War. And then he continued always to spend the Christmas holiday with troops wherever they were deployed, be it Vietnam, be it Korea, um, and all of us uh, who have succeeded him have continued this, this tradition. And it really is um, a very beautiful moment in the sense that uh, you're with people at a time of year when generally people, if they can, gather with their families. And uh, military who are deployed can't do that. Uh, well, in Bahrain, there are families, but uh, in Qatar, for example, there are very few and very little possibility to bring a family. So in a certain sense, you come to the serviceman or woman at a time when uh, they're most in, in need of that, uh, um, that affection, that, that pastoral care. And I've always enjoyed these, uh, these opportunities. Um, obviously, we celebrate the sacred liturgy uh, together, but then there are also social encounters. There's also the opportunity to visit um, the people where they where they work um, and see what they do. And military people in general like to tell you wh uh, what they do, what their activities are. Um, I can remember the last time I was in the Middle East uh, for the Christmas holidays, just going and visiting the different uh, guard posts and and talking with the, well, in this case, it was with the airmen there, um, an opportunity just to, to interchange, to, to show a little bit of human warmth, um, to hear how they're doing. Uh, generally, they can tell you how soon it will be before they go back home um, or, or how long they've been there. And so these are opportunities really to, to share in the life of uh, the men and women who protect us and who fulfill their responsibilities in service to the whole nation, even at a, at a great personal sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so to build on that, so my son was born at the tail end of 2020, and 2021 we spent quite a bit of time out to sea, so it was... Uh, difficult. And uh, I, I really just, my wife made it wonderful that every day she sent me a, a picture of our son. So I still got to watch him grow uh -huh. when I was out to sea. And then when I got back, it's been terrific getting to develop a relationship with him. Uh, so that has been a great joy in my life. Um, so people who have been uh, deployed, you minister directly to them when they are stationed overseas. They are part of your responsibility. Um, I guess let's tie that back into your motto, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Uh, do you have to, uh, 
I guess, modify or specify your message, your um, your speeches when you when you talk with people that are deployed, so that it can be more tailored toward uh, people who you know haven't seen their family in six months. Well, certainly, obviously, that comes into uh, that comes very much into play um, in our conversations, and I, I, I guess I would put things on on two levels. There's the moments of um, you know, like the homily at a liturgy. That's uh, that's one discourse, um, and there's another. Uh, level of discourse when you're talking with an individual uh, face to face, and 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 generally in those instances, I try to listen um, more than uh, than than speak. Give him or her the opportunity to uh, uh, tell me what's what's uh, on their hearts and what uh, um, what their concerns are, um, and that's for me. That's a good way to learn and and almost to take the pulse. Of the archdiocese in a in a in a very real way. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember. So real quick, uh, uh, for those listening, uh, priests in the archdiocese of military services are actually on loan from other dioceses, um, and so one of the priests that I'm friends with, who's a chaplain in the navy, made a comment that I'd like to pose to you. Um, some people treat this job as their religion. Do you see that at all? How do you encounter such a mindset? Well, I think there's always the danger um, in any walk of life uh, that uh, you can be so focused on what you're doing um, that you exclude everything else. Um, and then in a real sense, that does become uh, your religion or your, your whole motive for for being and for acting um in one sense uh you want everyone to both be dedicated to what he or she is doing uh you also want them to be competent um but at the same time uh i think it's very important to ensure that all of this fits into the larger picture and fits in also to the pilgrimage that is um, uh, the whole purpose of our life. Uh, everything doesn't end here, um, and so it's 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 good. And even even the military recommend, recognizes that there is a spiritual dimension to uh, to uh, the human person, and they try to cultivate that uh, that dimension by the presence of chaplains. And uh, also by uh, making sure that there are there are other activities um, on on military installations as well. So um, I think in in general the the ideal is is that yes we're competent in what we do, but uh, we also are a person with a, with a broader uh, uh, with broader interests and uh, and and those can be cultivated. And of course. Um, <laughs> Coming back to uh, you know to my motto, also the importance for me that uh, everything is uh, leading to that fullness of life with the Lord who calls us to Him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, my wife worked for a while uh, before our son was born, and um, when I talked with her about this same quote from our friend, uh, it she mentioned that you know that's not just specific to people in the military that is a, a temptation in civilian life as well um but like ultimately your job isn't what's going to fulfill you now certainly in the military there is uh, a a greater draw to try and make it your almost a vocation but uh yeah ultimately this is not your fulfillment you know this is this is more job and less vocation yeah Uh, so could you speak a little bit about this uh, awkward, All interesting, right. uh, what's that? It, it, you're, you're breaking up here. Okay. Um, can you hear me now okay? Your Excellency? Uh, could you speak to this interesting uh, position where military service 
members are part of the archdiocese of the military and their own diocese, their their geographic diocese. How does that interplay? Well, that's basically that's up to the choice of the individual. And I've I've witnessed. Um, in fact, I just came back from a symposium with with young uh, with Catholic young adults in the military, um, and uh, many uh, choose uh, to get involved in a local parish, and that's really their their option. Um, and then, of course, uh, many of them then might engage in the in the military Catholic community when they're stationed overseas, where perhaps the language uh, it presents a challenge or, uh, or religious education for their children presents a challenge. So um, the document uh, which governs uh, military ordinariates, which is called Spirituale Militum Cure, the spiritual care of the military, um, basically permits uh, individuals to choose uh, what uh, what option uh, they they prefer, or best better yet, what option best meets their needs? It's interesting um, talking to a number of uh, uh, these young people uh, who are active duty. They said, "Well, during the week, if I can, I go to mass on on base or on post because it's it's convenient and it's right it's right where I work." But then on the weekend, uh, I go to the local parish, and they might be involved in the local parish as well, uh, perhaps leading groups or uh, preparing couples for marriage or, or, or teaching uh, uh, religious education. So um, in one sense, uh, we enrich each other because we also sometimes depend on the local uh, diocese for uh, certain needs that we can't meet uh, ourselves. So I think there's a uh, there's a good interchange. Uh, there's a healthy um, sharing of both resources and people, um, and and thus far I think it it, it works very well. Um, mm -hmm. I've actually uh, done exactly that. Taken full advantage of mass on base or on my ship during the week. And then on the weekends, you know, we go to our parish out in town with the family. Um, so that's been a great joy that I've been able to experience uh, in my career. So uh, great. Uh, so in the Archdiocese of the Military Services, um, we have in the military, we have this this award, the Medal of Honor. Uh, and in the Catholic Church, we have canonizations. Um, as I understand it, there are a, a quite a few priests who have been granted the Medal of Honor for uh, performance above and beyond the call of duty in a time of war. Um, can you talk about people who have received the Medal of Honor? Or do we have any canonizations for priests that were uh, active duty chaplains? Well, in terms of the Medal of Honor, I think it's significant to note that in the 20th and 21st century, uh, the only recipients, the only chaplains who have received the Medal of Honor are Catholic priests. Um, so that is very significant. Okay. Um, <laughs> in terms of the process for canonization, there are three priests right now, uh, who, all of whom were military chaplains, uh, whose causes have been introduced. There is okay. Father Emil Capon, who was a chaplain during this, the Korean War. Uh, he's a priest of the Diocese of Wichita, also a Medal of Honor winner, uh, posthumously, obviously. Um, and his cause is being uh, fostered by the Diocese of Wichita. There is Father Verbis Lafleur, a priest uh, who uh, died in the Philippines during the Second World War. A priest of Lafayette, Louisiana, um, died heroically pushing people out of a prison ship that had been mistakenly torpedoed by the Allied forces, and he saved uh, many lives. And also the example that he gave was an inspiration to uh, to uh, many, many of his, uh, of his, uh, well, at that point, his men. He was in the Army Air Corps. And his cause is, as I said, has been introduced by the uh, Diocese of Lafayette, Louisiana. It's at the very beginning. Then the third chaplain whose cause has been introduced is the Servant of God, 
uh, Vincent Capodano, who was a, a priest of Marino, was a Navy chaplain, but served with the Marines and died uh, ministering to um, uh, Marines during a battle in Vietnam. And his cause has been introduced. He has also won the Medal of Honor. Uh, his cause has been introduced and is fostered by the Archdiocese for the Military Services. We are awaiting the evaluation by the Committee of Theologians from the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. And so we should know in May if they recognize that he did and die giving, did indeed die giving his life for others. Uh, and that would move us one step closer to uh, to the beatification uh, of this of this servant of God very inspiring very inspiring figure mm -hmm. that is yeah truly inspiring lives and stories and you said by May you're expecting an answer for uh, the first step in that canonization process yes that is correct that would be the evaluation by the theologians that he did indeed, um, give his life in, 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 uh, so that others might live. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, that is certainly exciting. Um, and I got to imagine that you are just waiting with bated breath. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that in the 19th and, or 20th and 21st century, the only people who have been awarded the Medal of Honor have been Catholic priests. The only... Now, I don't mean to like push our own buttons <laughs> too much, but uh, could you speak a little to that? Yeah. Well, um, I think it's significant. I, and I want to make it very clear. The only chaplains who receive the Medal of Honor, there are... There are lay people who receive the yes. Medal of Honor. <laughs> yes. I, I don't want... The movie Hacksaw Ridge. That's right. I've, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so chaplains... Catholic priests. Right. Thank you for the clarification. I think it's because of, uh, in a very real sense, uh, I, I would guess two factors. One, uh, a priest's total identification uh, with his people. Uh, and I think that willingness to give so much of himself uh, in order to, to meet the needs of those people. Um, and... Uh, I think also probably in play is the fact that, uh, um, and this is not to diminish in any way the, the tremendous work and the great uh, spirit of service on the part of chaplains of other religious denominations, but I think probably also coming into play would be, uh, a, you know, a priest is celibate. Um, and so, you know, he probably doesn't have in the back of his mind that uh, he has responsibilities for, for someone else as well or for a family. Uh, I think that's also uh, a factor, although that would probably uh, require some more uh, study because, of course, uh, I think of one of the Medal of Honor winners, Father O'Callaghan, uh, um, who, who lived. <laughs> he, he didn't win the medal because he, because he died uh, uh, serving, his, uh, serving his sailors, but uh, he continued to live and went back to Holy Cross College where he taught and I think where he and that's where he's he's buried now. So um, it, that's perhaps that second reason is not as influential as as the first. Mm -hmm. OK, well, thank you. Um, how do you uh, interplay with the various chaplains in the Navy of different religions and different denominations? Uh, well, my contact with them is more uh, peripheral uh, in the sense that uh, my responsibility is for the Catholic community. I'm the, the shepherd of that community, and so I would interact, uh, obviously, more with the Catholic priests uh, who serve those communities. However, for instance, when I came to Norfolk, obviously I I, I met with the uh, the chaplains who were there of other denominations. I even participated in a service that they held to commemorate the uh, uh, anniversary of, um, uh, of of Pearl Harbor because I was there on the well on the vigil of the uh, of, of the seventh of December, um, and so I was able to participate in that service with the uh, with the. Uh, chaplains of other other denominations and so that interaction has always been uh, very very positive um i just uh, received an invitation to uh, uh speak at the prayer breakfast at, at fort meade and that invitation was obviously issued by uh, the uh garrison chaplain there who is who is protestant 
So in a, in a sense, there's a there's a good interaction. I think we uh, we interact when uh, uh, when there's a need, um, and that can be either uh, a problem, but it can also be something very positive, like like the prayer breakfast or like the commemorative uh, service for uh, the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, so I have uh, one question here um, regarding your your pastorship of the Archdiocese of the Military Services. So the military has very distinct policies that go directly contrary to Catholic teaching. So how do you uh, balance being a part of this archdiocese, leading it, shepherding it, and yet faced with uh, these policies regarding you know, uh, uh, pregnancies and uh, mass distribution of contraceptive, LGBT pride and policies in place. Um, how, how do you how do you balance shepherding such a flock and like not being able to, I don't know, not not influence these in any way, but like th these are official policies put forward by the organization that you are a part of? Well, I think here it's very important to emphasize that um, uh, and the Archbishop for the military services, not of the military services. So I shepherd, okay. uh, I shepherd the people. I assure uh, Catholic uh, services for those people. Um, however, uh, I have been very clear um, in terms of the Catholic Church's uh, teaching on all of the issues that uh, that you've mentioned, um, and also uh, have. Uh, ensured that Catholic priests will not engage in activities that are counter, contrary to the teaching of, of the Catholic Church. Um, and in general, uh, that, is, it is res that is respected. Uh, we have the great example of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, when partial birth abortion was, uh, uh, was uh, being uh, fostered uh, by the United States and a, a postcard campaign was initiated by the Catholic Church to influence legislators into voting against this. And uh, Father Vincent Rigdon, who was an Air Force chaplain, distributed these postcards uh, at a mass and was reprimanded. And so he sued the United States Air Force and won. Because, of course, mm -hmm. what happens in a Catholic religious service, or while Catholic education is being conducted, religious education is being conducted, that answers to me. It doesn't answer to the Department of Defense. And that is uh -huh. that is protected by the First Amendment. And I can assure you that in the last 14 years, I've learned a great deal more about the First Amendment than I ever thought I needed to know. <laughs> Oh gosh! Wow, wow! Well, but that, and also, like, to successfully sue for that right, because military people are not generally allowed to sue the U.S. government. You give up certain rights. Uh, I find that very incredible and astonishing that that he was successful in this lawsuit. That's terrific to hear. Well, it's important to remember that when you raise your right hand to defend the Constitution of the United States, uh, you're doing it for us civilians, but you don't renounce your own First Amendment rights. And yeah. I will yeah. make sure that Catholics are allowed to observe their First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. And actually, uh, I know uh, a priest who recently became a chaplain and was facing uh, some pushback for pol practices that we have in Catholicism uh, when he was in that chaplain school. And I I understand that actually made it up to you and then you managed to uh, smooth over any sort of discrepancies at chaplain school. So thank you for that. Um, I guess real quick, one last question. Um, can you tell us about your work as a member of the board of directors of the National Catholic Bioethics Center? What does that involve? Uh, that involves basically, um, you know, it involves overseeing um, how the uh, bioethics center is, is run in, you know, on very high level questions, um, recently had a search, uh, well, recently about three years ago for a new president, um, when, uh, Dr. Uh, Haas, uh, retired 
And um, so it's, it's that kind of question. And then obviously we approve the budget. Uh, we approve certain questions about the, the organization of the Bioethics Center. Um, however, the professional work done by the bioethicists, um, we, we are more recipients of that than, than uh, those who direct that, uh, uh, that activity. Uh, in fact, I'm looking forward mm -hmm. very much next month to, uh, they do a, uh, every two years they do a, a workshop for the bishops, and that's a time of, of, of great learning, and uh, I'm looking very, and that'll be also one of the times when we have our board meeting. So I'm looking forward to that, to that meeting. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I had a couple uh, listener questions, but I'm looking at the time. We don't have much, only about two or three minutes. So uh, I guess we'll go with this question from Angie. Um, are military people drawn to the same books as the Bible as, uh, as civilians? <laughs> Do you use similar or different passages in your homilies? Well, in terms of homilies, those are always on the, the Word of God that's proposed by the liturgy that day. So those are always the same. They're the same universally. Um, I think you would be in a better position to answer if, uh, if there are uh, particular favorite books of the Bible that are more cultivated by, uh, for example, an officer, uh, someone in the Navy than, uh, than, than I would be able to answer that question. <laughs> Well, I guess my response would simply be that such as, you know, your, your, uh, uh, your motto, seek ye the kingdom of God. My favorite Bible verse is somewhat similar, um, which is, uh, uh, from Isaiah, who will, who will I send says the Lord send me. It's like, that's my favorite Bible verse. And, uh, I find that to be rather indicative of people in the military, what they, what they prefer. So, um, okay. Well, Hey, uh, your Excellency, Archbishop Broglio of the Archdiocese of Military Services, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciated this conversation. I wish you the best in your future endeavors. Um, and with that, thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very much. God bless you.